Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bandash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. Uh, my guest, of course, is Imam Muhammad al -Asi. We are going to continue to discuss the issue of the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. But I'm going to, first of all, let you know that Imam al -Asi is the mufassir of this tafsir, the Ascended Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Twelve volumes of this tafsir have already been published. Two more are ready to go to press and many more volumes are under preparation. Each volume is available at $30 each including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. And you can order them from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gomley, Ontario, L0H1G0. So, Brother Muhammad, welcome back to the program. And I'm sorry that in our last episode, I had to cut, cut you off at a point, but I think let's recap. Okay. I wanted, I asked you to tell us exactly what happened on the early morning of March the 5th, 1983. So perhaps you can go over the, the details again, as you mentioned in the last episode, so that our viewers can get a better perspective and then we can link up this whole thing and continue the story. Sure, on March 5th, 1983, very early in the morning before sunrise, there were this violent knocking on the door uh, of the quarters, the living quarters at the Islamic Center, which I was in with my wife, my uh, pregnant wife and my uh, one uh, almost two-year-old daughter. And so um, uh, after they identified themselves on the other side of the door, the door was locked. Uh, they said, uh, we, we want to come in and serve you um, some orders. Um, and they came in. Did they break the door down? Or you no, they didn't it? break the door down. You opened it for them. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I was in the process of opening the door, but it looks like they had a key or something. They opened it, and they came in. So when they came in, as I said, there were two of them, vigilantes, mercenaries, whatever you want to call them, African Americans, uh, probably hired by the Saudi embassy and whoever is paying for all of this uh, operation. And along them there was a lawyer. The lawyer's name is Sharif Sidqi. I think he's still alive. Um, uh, later on he worked in, in circles that are close to the Saudis. Uh, anyways, he had a piece of paper. He gave me a piece of paper and he said this is to advise you that you have to vacate the premise uh, right now. And then they told me, you have about 10 minutes to collect your valuables and leave, you and your family. And you have a choice. Either you go with us to a place we have prepared, an apartment or something, uh, or you go to prison. You can choose whichever you want. I mean, if I, honestly, if it was only myself, I'd rather go to prison. But I had a family with me. So I said, okay, let's, uh, let's go to whatever place you're talking about uh, it seems a better option than going to prison, obviously, with a family. So um, we, uh, this quarters is on the second level. We descended the, the stairs there, uh, going down. Then we saw all of this force outside. I mean, uh, law enforcement from every hue, and, 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 and you, couldn't, you wouldn't imagine their numbers just swarming left and right and all over. So anyways, they took us to uh, a southern um, suburb of Washington, D.C. Technically, it's in the state of Virginia, but it's part of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. We went up to, I guess it was the ninth floor, and there was an apartment there. They opened it. It was a furnished apartment. They opened it. They said, you can, you can go in and, and um, be settled. We did not go in. We just looked and left. We left. We made a couple of telephone calls. My wife managed in those 10 minutes when we were still in the living quarters at the center to make a couple of ten telephone calls. And so we returned to the center. And when we returned to the center, there was all of these... Uh, still, all of these forces all around the place, law enforcement personnel, uh, SWAT teams, Washington, D.C. police, undercover agents, 
spies. I don't know. I mean, must have been a couple of hundred of them. Uh, and uh, the media now was there, began coming. You had the BBC, you had uh, the local media there, ABC and CBS and NBC, and you had correspondence from different newspapers and all of this. They were, they were coming to us, asking us questions and going to the other side. The other side had their own spokesperson. So what did they ask you? They asked us, well, what's happening? Could you explain to us what's happening? I said, yeah, I can explain to you what's happening. And I explained that we got expelled from the center by force. They took us across the river there in, in the um, southern suburb of Washington, D.C., and now we are back. And they are telling us, we heard, because there was indirect contact, because right now news got around in the Washington, D.C. area to the Muslim community. And Muslims began coming. Uh, to the Islamic Center, and there was probably about a hundred of us Muslims in that time frame there, and there was there were the, the other side, and the media was going back and forth, and we were explaining to them what was happening, and the other side was their version of of what is happening is they're closing the center because they have information that there's a catch of arms inside, and that the center needed renovations. There was no catch of arms inside. And the center did not need any renovations. Did the media people ask you whether there are any weapons in there? They did. Yeah, and, and we flatly denied it because that was the truth. There was no weapons whatsoever. It was a flagrant lie. And so uh, this is the way... Did the media report that, that you, you have stated that there are no weapons over there? These are allegations, uh, lies that are being told against you? No. The media didn't report that? Uh, not in that fashion. Uh, the, the media highlighted the other side of the issue, saying that the center is being closed because um, there's some suspicion of, you know, unbecoming activities or something uh, in, in that respect. But no, the media was not fair in reporting. They were not balanced in reporting both sides. You expect them to give you the opinion and the counter opinion, but not in this case. Which means, in, with the way we understand this, the media somehow was in, in on this. Okay, so um, you and your family were physically uh, removed from the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. Uh, what happened next? I mean, how long was the center then closed? And if it was, for how long? What happened? Okay, this is what happened. They closed the center. The center has a gate. Well, at that time it didn't have a gate, but before... They closed the center. Yeah, the, the center has some steps that you go up, about five, four or five steps, and then there's the, the gate there. They locked that. They closed it and locked it. And inside, there's the, the door to the center, and that was locked. So it was off limits. No one could access the center. So in the first weeks of that incident, of that violation of our rights, our secular rights and our religious rights. Uh, during those first weeks, we were actually praying five prayers on the lawn. There's a lawn in front of the center. We were praying our five prayers there on the lawn. And this was in, in March, uh, March, April, etc. Around that time. It, it was March, April. Sometimes the weather was very, very severe, mm. but we still maintained our presence there, and they still had it locked and. Our Jumu'ah prayers was, we were praying it right there in front of the center in the yard area. Now, that went on until uh, the Eid that we had, which was around July 10, 11th or 10th of that same year, 1983. We had our holiday on that day. Now, this is what happened on that day. Well, before we go to what happened on that day. Some individuals approached us, you know, in, in, in this critical time, there were individuals coming to us, we don't know who they are, but anyways, they're coming to us and saying, there's a suggestion that you move your congregational Friday prayer from in front of the center to a house that's one block um, east, uh, southeast of the center. You move... Your, your, your congregational prayer to that building. Now, we did our little homework 
investigation. What's this building? Who's, who, who, I mean, why are they allocating this building for us? It turns out that building many, many years ago was um, the embassy of Bangladesh. But the embassy of Bangladesh sold it to William Casey. William Casey was the head of the CIA at that time. So they wanted us to go and perform our Mass Friday Jumu'ah prayers in the house of the CIA, of the CIA chief. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. Uh, you can write a book about that. Anyways, so uh, come Ramadan of that year, the, the month in which we fast, they constructed an iron fence around the yard so we no longer could perform our religious service in the lawn area because now it's locked in. And so we, we began praying on the side, literally on the sidewalk. I mean, there's a sizable sidewalk there. And we began praying our, uh, have, uh, offering our services there. Uh, and then the, uh, at the end of Ramadan, when we observe our Eid, our holiday, uh, we went there early in the morning because prayers are held early in the morning around sunrise. And uh, abracadabra, the gates were opened. Without any prior notice. Without, we were optimistic. We said, well, maybe they had a change of heart. Or, we don't know what's going on. I mean, we want the message to be opened and we want to go inside and perform our services like every Muslim should be able to do. So we went inside and uh, people were coming for uh, the service and uh, we were saying the takbirat, the chanting uh, that precedes the Eid prayer. And then all of a sudden, um, the, the police came in the, the same individual who had come early in the morning, who was a vigilante, so-called guard type of character, he was there with the pol Washington, D.C. police, and they, uh, as we were giving, uh, expressing our chanting, the takbirat, they arrested us. Wow. Yes. They came inside the masjid with their boots on. You know, that's, uh, that's uh, an insult. Yes. And uh, they, they put us in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. They took us to these caddies, these, uh, you know, police uh, vehicles. And they took us on that Eid, on our holiday, they took us to jail. They locked us up. There's about 50 of us. That they like, because some people, when this was beginning to happen, left, left the center. We did not leave. And so they, they tied our hands and they took us off and we spent our holiday behind bars. So then what happened next? What happened next is they told us we are guilty of unlawful entry into the center and of disturbing a religious service. Was there a religious service taking place? No, we, we were not. We, it was at the beginning. We were just you know, saying the takbirat. Yeah. There was no khutbah. There was no sermon. There was no uh, prayer service going on or nothing. Anything like that. But anyways, that's what they charged us with. And uh, we retained uh, a couple of lawyers to defend us. And... Um, we had to go to court for four months. These are misdemeanor charges. These are no felonies. These are not one of these, you know, cases in which you know this can go on for weeks and weeks, like in, right now, this Chapo Guzman thing that's going on in New York. This is a simple, you know, you know almost like a, a traffic violation. But anyways, this went on for four months. What do they want to do? I mean, they wanted. To, we 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 are breadwinners. We are responsible for our families. Uh, thank uh, uh, an air and an environment of solidarity and support. And so uh, we weathered those four months in court. And um, those two charges, one of them 
had to be uh, ruled on by the judge, and the other one had to be ruled on by the jury. The judge had to rule on the charge that we disturbed a religious service. Now, you have to know a little about the judge here. He, had, he passed away about 20 odd years ago. But he used to be with the FBI. And then he became a judge. And then he retired. They called him from retirement and they had us appear in not the normal court, but a building that was abandoned for court purposes. It used to belong to that court structure, but the, uh, the buildings were updated. They built new court buildings, and this was an older structure. So they put all our hearings in a se almost a separate building from where all of the other hearings are held. So uh, the judge, to be honest with you, the judge was an honest man. Uh, and towards the end, the final week or so of these trials, four months, he requested the Justice Department to drop the charge of disturbing a religious service. He even went further he asked the Justice D Department to dismiss the whole case. Did the Justice Department do that? The Justice Department at that time sent its number three man. He was the third high, highest ranking official in the Justice Department. His name is Rudy Giuliani. That would ring a bell in a lot of minds. I'm sure people are familiar with that character. Anyways, he came and he told the judge, we're going to get them. Really? Yeah, that's what he said. We're going to get them. Now, get us for what? But that's what he told the judge. And I think the judge felt that, uh, it appeared he was a man of conscience. He felt that, you know, something's foul about this. All, but there's nothing he could do. I mean, he could only go as far as he, he did. And that's to his credit. So anyways, uh, the jury, uh, he draw, he himself... He said, I find these defendants, there's about 50 of us, I find them innocent. And they are not guilty of this offense. So we're clear as far as that charge is concerned. Now the jury, there were 12 jurors, and they had to rule on whether we are guilty of unlawful entry into the Islamic Center. They deliberated for about a week. And because there, you know, there has to be a, a unanimity in, in, the, uh, in, in the final judgment. So they came and they said, we are guilty of unlawfully entering the Islamic Center. Wow. Yeah. An, an Islamic Center or mosque, which is a God's house, which is open to everybody, not yeah. even Muslims, but also non-Muslims. Yeah. And they said, you are okay. Exactly. And so they used that as a democle sword over our ne heads and necks, and they said, you can't enter the center. Yeah. And so, so since that time, you and the congregation have been praying outside. Correct. And uh, how far away are you from the Islamic center, or what is the sort of, share that information with us? Oh yeah, that's, uh, at the beginning, we were praying on the sidewalk in front of the entrance to the Islamic Center, that major gate, because they put up this iron fence, mm -hmm. the gate of that iron fence, we were praying right there, right in front of it. And then the, uh, the people inside the center who turned out to be, one of them is a Saudi, the other one was a Palestinian who had, has passed away. He was the one who gave the sermons, and that Lebanese... Uh, became the spokesperson for for that group, and they had a a Savaki Iranian guy who was in charge of security. So uh, they forbid us. And by the way, uh, there was a police force there every Friday. Three or four police cruisers were parked there every Friday 
as if we're going to do something that is unlawful or something like that. And that continued for over, over uh, 12 or 13 years. Of course, they disappeared after that. They, got, they learned their lesson that we are not people of violence or uh, breaking any laws or anything like that. So the police force withered away. But we, we uh, maintained our presence there uh, in front of the center for the, in front, right in front of the entrance for the first month or two. And then they told us this is sort of getting in the way of the people who are entering and exiting from the center. So we can't pray there. We have to pray across the street. So we went across the street there's uh, apartment buildings there, residents, uh, people who are living in these apartment buildings. And we had our microphone, and obviously you need a microphone because there's a lot of traffic. If you don't have one, no one's going to hear your sermon and your service. So we remained there for about 12 or 13 years. And then the people who were living in these buildings, in these uh, condominiums or townhouses, the people who were living there, they complained to the police that our service every Friday is disturbing their peace. So the, poli the Washington, D.C. police came to us and said, uh, we received complaints from uh, the people who are living here in these buildings, and you're going to have to go back across the street, but not in front of the center, but to the side of the center. Uh, still on the main um, uh, street there, Massachusetts Avenue. And that's where we've been for the last, I don't know, 13 or 15 years. Now, um, so you've been praying every Friday? Every Friday and the two holidays. That's 54 times a year. The so, Eid. The, uh, the Eid. Eid. Holidays, yes. Correct. Yes. And uh, during this time... Um, I, neither you nor any members of the congregation have ever committed any crime or anything. You just perform your 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 Juma prayers or your with your prayers, and then and then you leave from there. Correct. Okay. Now, you are an American citizen. That's correct. Wouldn't you have the right to be able to go and pray wherever you want? You would think so, right? So what does that say about uh, all of this American democracy that we are we hear about that they want to deliver to the rest of the world on cruise missiles? Yes. It, it, it's it, democracy is on trial. As far as we are concerned, American democracy has been on trial for 36 years, and it's been guilty of assassinating its own democracy on Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., which is, I, as I said previously, we're about two blocks away from the vice president's residence there. We are uh, on, a, on a street that has scores of embassy on it, which means the whole world is passing by every Friday in the form of these diplomats who go back and forth. And this has been going on for 36 years. Let me, let me add an important point I think um, the viewers should be aware of, and that is the administrator of the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C., see the State Department in the United States, it puts out a yearly um, book in which it um, uh, identifies each diplomatic mission and the individuals in that, those diplomatic missions. Now, in the Saudi Arabian diplomatic mission, the Saudi Arabian embassy, uh, in that State Department book, the person who's administering the Islamic Center is registered and identified as an administrative attaché of the Saudi Arabian embassy. This means that there is a diplomat who's running a church. That means there, or a masjid in this case, that means there is a violation of the American constitution and the American law in which there's a separation of church and state. So not only are they violating our, the citizens and the legal residents of the United States, our rights, whether they, it's a civic right or a religious right to enter the Islamic Center, they're also violating their own, we're violating our own constitution 
by having someone who is a politician who's running a religious institute. And, uh, and this has been going on. And, and a diplomat of a foreign country yeah. doing this in the United States. Exactly. And getting away with it. And the media is so deaf, dumb, and blind to all of this, as if none of this exists. Where are the people? I mean, they're supposed to be... This, imagine if this incident was explained to the public what, what type of reaction there would be. But no. Well, Muhammad, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. I know that this must be really very painful for you and for the members that are over there. But we pray for you and we, we inshallah, we hope that uh, this, this would um, uh, ultimately resolve in the victory for truth and justice, inshallah. And the truth shall set, set you free. free. Uh, you've been watching my discussion with Imam Muhammad al Asi regarding the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. And this gives you some indication that we think, those of us living in North America, that we are free. Well, here is some examples of the kind of freedoms that are not available to us. We can't even go into our own centers to pray. And these foreign diplomats come and they take over our centers and they want to run them. And these governments, particularly in the United States, does absolutely nothing about it. In fact, colludes in their crimes. So that will sort of, sort of give you some indication of what really is happening. You've been watching my conversation with Imam Muhammad al Asi. He's the Mufassir of this Tafsir, the, uh, the Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Third, uh, for 12 volumes have been published. Two more are ready to go to press, and other volumes are under preparation. Each volume is available at $30 each, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America from Crescent International, PO Box 747. Gomley, Ontario, L0H1G0. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Muslim Perspectives. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.